Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at PTV World. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important stories. The first is in reference to the increase of terrorist activities in Pakistan, unfortunately, that we've seen more so in KP and Balochistan than other parts of the country, but much more uh, than we had in the past, especially since the end of the ceasefire with uh, the uh, TTP. And now we also know that uh, TJP, which is the Rike Jihad Pakistan, a new group affiliated with the TTP, has also emerged and has claimed responsibility responsibility for a series of attacks that have taken place um, in which 25 um, uh, Pakistan army soldiers were martyred while 27 terrorists were killed in total and these are three different incidents which took place in KP's Deir Ismail Khan. This is important especially in reference to what has happened uh, throughout the year in the rise of these terrorist activities and also the fact that this is also the uh, the day on which the highest number of security personnel um, have been martyred um, in one day in the entire year. And this is important not only in the context of what has been happening with the TTP um, and now, of course, other factions and groups such as the TJP, but also in terms of uh, how the illegal activities within Pakistan and the law and order situation, particularly the terrorist activities, have also been linked to Afghan nationals. A series of measures have also been taken um, with reference to the illegal foreign nationals, including Afghans in Pakistan. Um, um, measure that is all still continuing um, in the kind of implementation plan that has been uh, started after a deadline was given. But irrespective of that, there is always the engagement that Pakistan has expected um, and carried out with the Afghan Taliban regime in Afghanistan. And also just now after this uh, series of deadly attacks, the Dimash has also been sent to the Afghan authorities there, uh, talking about how this is uh, something that Pakistan strongly condemns and has taken notice of, and the fact that uh, there needs to be a serious response uh, from the Afghan side with regards to their territory not to, to be used against any other, especially Pakistan, of course, which has faced a lot of uh, the brunt of these activities while safe havens are being provided across the border. And so we're going to be taking a look at what has happened um, in the night between 11th and 12th and also with reference to what has been going on in Pakistan and the measures that Pakistan has been taking and the zero tolerance policy that Pakistan has reiterated time and again and the way that we would now like to move forward, especially with the Afghan authorities um, in Afghanistan, and then also with reference to what needs to be perhaps done at home, whether or not there is a need to reevaluate any strategy or any certain action to be taken, and then how exactly is Pakistan going to be proceeding in the aftermath of these attacks. Uh, this is something that is going to be the focus of our show in the first segment today. Our next one is going to be taking a look at the economic situation of the country. Um, in which the very important decision by the State Bank of Pakistan has also emerged uh, in which the key policy rate has been maintained at 22%. And this is something that perhaps was expected by a lot of um, economic experts talking about how this is something uh, uh, that uh, will be seen um, in, in the near future as well. But it is also expected that there is going to be a positive trajectory for the trend of inflation in Pakistan. While at the same time, um, a lot of the analysts have also talked about positive developments with reference to the uh, political and economic atmosphere within the country that has led to a lot of uh, improvements in many indicators, um, including, of course, we've seen the PSX um, also gain, and once again, uh, again, uh, 400 points. Um, this is important, especially given the fact that um, there was a halt earlier that we saw yesterday, and what we, have, of course, have witnessed in the past as well, especially with reference to the first review of uh, the IMF, um, the staff level agreement of which has been achieved, uh, there is a trend that that is moving uh, towards um, a strong and sustainable um, economic recovery plan for Pakistan. But whether or not we're going to be seeing any shift in that given the global indicators and also the change in the political atmosphere within Pakistan, of course, remains to be seen. There is a lot of emphasis on continuity, though, especially with reference to the SIFC and other measures that the caretaker setup has taken and, and previously also have been taken to ensure uh, that our engagements with the IMF and our engagements on the economic front are not impacted uh, by a government change. But how much are we going to be able to achieve that in the future is still also something um, that will be seen later. So we're going to try and analyze what has happened um, in, in the recent days and months and then also in light of 
of um, the state bank's policy uh, decision and whether or not uh, the trends that we see today will be seen um, in the first quarter of the fiscal uh, in in the uh, first quarter of the next year as well. So that is going to be our discussion in the second segment of the show today. Um, for this and more, as always, I've been joined in the studio uh, by Raja Faisal, senior analyst, and also by Mr. Farooq Badafi, who's joined us online. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of the show. We've also been joined by our guests online, uh, Brigadier Rita and Mr. Rashid Bali. Jinju has also directed research. Apri, thank you very much, Jinju, for joining us and being <coughs> a part of the discussion. And I'll start with you because we want to take a look at what's that what has happened in KP. Um, uh, in, in the nights of 11th and 12th, and especially the kinds yeah. of incidents that we have seen. This this marks um, um, a day in which we have lost the highest number uh, of uh, Pakistan army personnel in a single day in a series of these attacks. And we keep on talking about how there's a rise in terrorist activities in Pakistan. Um, uh, but of course, we are seeing um, uh, more and more loss of lives, and this is not something um, that, that we want to see. How exactly do you view these particular incidents in light of the kind of uh, measures that, that Pakistan has already taken um, and whether or not there will be um, uh, any any enhancement uh, or any additional measure uh, that will be taken in the aftermath of these attacks. We've been talking about these things in the past and uh, we've already uh, discussed a number of contributory factors that led to this situation and this spike in the terrorism. So I'll uh, discuss four things. First is the first contributory factor is the Afghan interim government and its uh, lukewarm attitude uh, towards controlling this uh, uh, terrorism uh, on its own territory. So ever since uh, IAG has come into power, we have seen a regular rise in the strength and uh, stridency of uh, TTP. And, uh, uh, and we are not uh, talking in uh, theory. Uh, there is tangible, concrete proof, technologically proven through electronic means that their handlers are inside Afghanistan and they were being given instructions uh, how to go about uh, planning this attack. And those have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, those communications have been uh, intercepted and uh, uh, there is a tangible proof of uh, involvement of TTP on a farm soil, using it as a base, as a sanctuary. So that's a very, very serious uh, issue. And I think we should take up this case at the highest possible forum with the uh, Afghan interim government. And uh, there's a need for a high ranking, uh, uh, you know, delegation from Pakistan comprising uh, uh, security, uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, community and uh, others to go and uh, have parlays and the layout in front of Taliban, uh, uh, IAG government, that uh, we must not uh, continue with this kind of uh, tolerance towards, uh, uh, you know, militant uh, groups on a farm soil. And uh, if the IAG cannot control, then perhaps a stage would come that we have to uh, think of taking action ourselves across the national border. The second point is that we have seen this Durban area is on the confluence of three provinces, Rochistan, Sindh and uh, Punjab. And it's a very difficult far-flung area, but still it's in the settled districts and uh, uh, there's an element of lack of efficacy of our uh, police also because the uh, KP police is overstretched. It is under capacity. It requires something like 19 billion rupees straight away to improve its uh, immediate capacity. They don't have uh, essential equipment, they, they are not very well organized and uh, this capacity deficit uh, deprives the first responder that in the counter-terrorism battle, police has got to be the first responders. So willy-nilly army has to take the brunt and uh, this was also a uh, uh, very clear uh, uh, evidence of that, that uh, the army element, they were out in the field to conduct an IBO. And uh, on that, an attack uh, was uh, done by a vehicle borne uh, uh, IED. And this uh, vehicle borne uh, explosive laden vehicle, who led it, who uh, gave them intelligence, 
who are their facilitators? I think this is there's, uh, there are a lot of questions that need to be answered by our law enforcement agencies like police. Army has done its best. It has offered its own spot resistance. It has uh, uh, killed 27 terrorists and it has taken the uh, bunt itself also. 23 uh, troops have been martyred. And I think it's because of uh, the explosive effect that one of the roofs collapsed and uh, so many casualties occurred. And we must be uh, cognizant of another reality that there is a complete administrative vacuum. Where are those uh, administrative uh, you know, uh, officers? And there's got to be a network of administration, district administration, which has uh, tentacles amongst the population and it offers a kind of a uh, local intelligence. Our local intelligence is completely, uh, I mean, at this point of time, uh, there's a need for gelling with the army intelligence, intelligence and uh, other intelligence agencies. But that local intelligence network is not very, very effective because of an administrative vacuum. And uh, police capacity deficit, uh, I've already spoken. Then there is a element of uh, a bit of a deprivation also. We see that uh, there are handy recruits, uh, those are who are recruited to the cause of TTP because of uh, lack of livelihood. I think we need to do something on that score as well by way of development of these areas, whether they are uh, uh, in the newly merged districts or some settled uh, districts which are uh, on the border regions of these newly merged districts. The element of deprivation, element of lack of livelihood, lack of opportunities and frustration, that uh, gives a very fertile ground for these uh, TTP elements to recruit their followers and uh, I think we need to work and we need at this point of time a whole of the nation approach and a whole of the society approach uh, only leaving it to army would not do army is standing firm army is rock solid army is taking the uh, uh, you know casualties and offering uh, supreme sacrifices but at this point of time are our politicians uh, serious is the whole effort of the political government geared towards uh, uh, you know uh, giving uh, this ttp threat a top priority or their policy uh, uh, you know priorities lie elsewhere what are the rest of the political parties doing are they politicking at this point of time in an election year or are they focused on this tangible clear and present danger to pakistan's security right. i think right. we and, need and, and, and i'm glad jinjua sub that you that you're raising that point because I, I would like to discuss that in further detail um, and a number of other issues in fact that you've raised but uh, before i do that i also want to discuss a little bit about the tariqat jihad pakistan which has claimed responsibility for the attacks and 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 whether or not when we talk about um uh, uh, the the involvement of afghan nationals or, or the way that we um require certain actions by the afghan taliban regime in afghanistan um, uh, how is that uh, linked with, with the way that we see TTP or now the TJP in Pakistan claiming responsibility for certain attacks, whether or not there is evidence of inter intelligence sharing between these factions and others or involvement of Afghan nationals, particularly in these attacks. I understand that a lot of other evidence has been established, but um, has that link been established with the, the, the attacks that we're talking about that has happened um, just the last night? Pakistan has a sectarian flavor and it is affiliated with ISKP and uh, we know that in Afghanistan there are non-state actors like ISKP which are very active and uh, they have a different agenda there, but they are all birds of the same feather. They share the same ideology, they share the same violent uh, propensity but uh, their operative uh, uh, tactics are different. Uh, I, uh, TJP has uh, certain links with uh, sectarian organizations inside Pakistan, inside Afghanistan. And I think uh, uh, they are more focused on uh, their sectarian agenda. But uh, once uh, they see that TTP is making uh, inroads, they make a common cause. And uh, there are various factions of TTP which had their own internal differences, like uh, Noor Wali Masood and uh, Hafiz Gul Bahadur. They are also now gelling together. And, uh, it uh, appears as if somebody is choreographing their whole effort and uh, from Afghanistan. So uh, they, the whole, uh, the base of the operation appears to be Afghanistan. We know that uh, they've got plenty of arms to, uh, you know, uh, those, 
that were left by the American forces. Uh, 250,000 uh, Afghan national uh, defense and security forces, they melted in thin air. Where did they go? They all went with their arms and they're all part of those renegade groups now. And uh, it's a complete, uh, uh, you know, chaos inside Afghanistan. IAG, contrary to its claim, is not in control of its own uh, territory. And uh, in order to... Uh, you know, exercise control over these non-state actors, they are looking the other way and sometimes they are making a common cause with them. And uh, that is the reason their uh, sectarian organizations like um, ISKP uh, and their affiliates, uh, TJP, they have also started gaining strength now. Right, absolutely. Um, and Farooq, I'd like to take this further in, in terms of um, the kind of demarch that Pakistan has delivered um, to the Afghan authorities um, in Afghanistan. And of course, we've talked about the kind of expectation that we have or, or the need for, for the Afghan Taliban regime to step up and make sure um, that their soil is not used against any other territory. But of course, we haven't seen that um, as yet in, in terms of the kind of will or capacity that is needed. Um, and now at the same time, we're also talking about the kind of measures that are being taken with reference to the illegal uh, foreign nationals, including Afghans um, in Pakistan. Um, and, and so while all of this continues, um, what really will be then uh, the way that this relationship is being taken forward with both the countries and how exactly then will the diplomatic or political channels be able to function um, while there seems to be a, lo a lot of trust deficit um, or, or, or perhaps differing views and perspectives in terms of what um, one has to do and what the other expects. Uh, right, uh, Sena, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, in case uh, anybody finds the visuals a little bit patchy, I'm traveling right now. Uh, 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 regarding what you were saying, uh, there are two aspects which are very clear that one has to actually point out. And uh, one is regarding, uh, you know, this low intensity warfare that continues unabated inside Pakistan and uh, the elements that are actually doing it. Um, and they're using Afghan soil uh, to carry out such attacks. Now, let me ask you, but just uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, thought experiment, uh, indulge me a little bit. Uh, saying that uh, the similar kind of thing is happening in India, and then the people might be in Pakistan. What exactly will be the response of the world community? Uh, how will uh, people actually address the concern that we might not at that time have uh, the kind of capacity to control it, right? Uh, the entire world will blame Pakistan for whatever happens there, despite the fact that it would be uh, in some aspects failure of the uh, of the elements on the other part, uh, other side. Uh, similarly, whatever is happening right now, uh, if it is happening in a, 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 from a one soil, then it is clear that it is a fun uh, government which is culpable, whether it is a transition government, whether uh, it is a caretaker or interim government. Uh, if you are in power, you are responsible for this. Now, um, I think that the government of Pakistan has actually put a lot of pressure, and there have been uh, signs that they might actually be trying to compensate as well, the Afghan Taliban. Uh, but these, there is this a strange kind of alternative series or alter, alternating, uh, you know, attacks from various elements, right? On one side, uh, we keep on seeing CTP attacking Pakistani uh, third cities and people here. Then as, point, uh, as was pointed out that Brigadier Saab, CJP, uh, is uh, associated with ISKP, and ISKP is an organization that kept on posing threats to Afghan Taliban as well, even though incident of such a, uh, you know, episodes have uh, uh, gone down in Afghanistan. So Pakistan has to simultaneously uh, keep putting pressure on Afghan Taliban to actually own up and stand up against these elements and uh, weed them out from Afghan soil. Uh, on the other side, Pakistan has to actually prepare itself uh, uh, by, as was the, being pointed out earlier, that the civilian side, especially the political side, has to be more sensitive to whatever is going on. And instead of bickering, they have to focus on these 
uh, existential issues. So the question then is, you know, uh, what exactly should be done? And uh, it is particularly regarding one consensus document that that we uh, accomplished, uh, you know, in 2014. Uh, two days, uh, four days later, there's anniversary of that uh, sad attack, which actually led to the national election plan. Now, I think that when, while we are actually implementing many of those points, uh, the civilian component actually is lacking. And why? Perhaps because politicians need a more detailed roadmap to agree on. And I think that uh, I've been asking this for quite some time, uh, and I believe that Pakistan has to have a national election plan 2.0 which actually spells out more detail how to actually take care of certain elements uh, hiding in Afghanistan, how to actually uh, um, uh, interact with Afghan Taliban, and what is our plan B there. And uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, hardening our border as we have been doing it for quite some time. And then, if there are any elements which are found inside Pakistan, bound. And then those people either carry a foreign, uh, you know, a passport uh, or for that matter, any kind of uh, um, uh, travel documents from any right, other but, country. Uh, Farooq, we may not have a National Action Plan 2.0, but don't we already have the answers to these questions? I mean, we do have a strategy with, with, with the Afghan Nationals, don't we? Uh, we do that. Uh, but uh, we need uh, far more, as I was pointing out. Economic factor is important. Who is aiding these people? Where exactly is the ecosystem that might be supporting it within Pakistan? So we have to actually build more consensus. My con concern is not merely whether there are enough points in the national election plan, but whether that consensus that was, uh, that was reached back then is sustainable or was sustained. Uh, in my view, uh, one political party clearly went against it. Uh, and then at that time, the state of Pakistan was also kind of sort of supporting that, uh, that step a certain people were. And then we ended up compromising national security by allowing the same element, somebody that uh, which we had almost defeated and we, uh, which had been actually flushed out of Pakistan. So we need a new discussion where uh, all stakeholders can actually come together similarly. For example, uh, military court, last time we were uh, debating this thing, we actually spoke about it. Then we saw there came a verdict. And after that, again, uh, you know, victims of various uh, terrorist attacks actually appealed to the courts to uh, not actually discontinue military court. These are uh, very important cases or issues, Sana, because these terrorists, uh, if they are not actually held accountable in a, a speedy trial, in a military court, they walk free. We know that. They have the capacity to uh, delay the entire justice system. So we have to have consensus and we have to have political will. If that is not there, then of course, state of Pakistan will find some ways to build that kind of consensus, but it will be at the cost of political party. Right, absolutely. And that's an important point, Faisal, when we talk about consensus, especially with what Janju Assam also referred to in, in terms of supporting whatever our military wing is doing um, with the kind of political and diplomatic channels that are also needed. And uh, while we talk about how we're going to deal with external forces, it's also, it's also important to have the consensus at home. Um, and what Farooq is pointing to us with, uh, with the actions of a particular party and what has been taken and uh, the result of which we are seeing today also, it also points towards whether or not when we talk about a consensus, whenever it's achieved, how is it that we actually ensure that that is in fact the stance that a political party or a person has and that whenever anybody comes in power, they are actually going to stand by that particular stance or that consensus that was achieved and not do otherwise? Yes, Anna, if we obviously look at the Pakistan's uh, politics right now, of course, uh, the political parties, they are not, uh, you know, sure about what kind of course they are taking uh, in this context. And, of course, in the uh, uh, current political fuss, we are seeing no position which is being taken by the political parties. I mean, everybody is uh, just busy in their own elections, not knowing that what kind of challenges uh, Pakistan is 
uh, facing right now and how to counter them. Uh, if we talk about, of course, today's uh, you know, sacrifices, first of all, let me highlight and hail the sacrifices of uh, Pakistan security forces, especially uh, Pakistan's military. They have been laying their lives for the motherland, for Pakistan, uh, time and again. And of course, uh, we know that for 20 years they have been fighting uh, in this war on terror. The war is still on and they are still fighting for Pakistan. And uh, when we talk about the, you know, uh, the loss, of course, IBOs, intelligence-based operations, they are, uh, you know, constantly taking place. And in few of them, of course, these kind of news came out, uh, come out in which uh, we lose uh, precious lives of our soldiers. Uh, salute to them and salute to their families as well because they are fighting uh, for Pakistan and for a better Pakistan. But political parties, of course, they need to understand that they have to take a stance on it and they have to uh, make sure that their stance is, of course, uh, in the favor of Pakistan and against the terrorism. And I think uh, that's how it should be. I would agree that uh, stronger uh, action must be taken uh, against uh, all of these uh, miscreants and all of these, uh, you know, banned outfits and out outfits which are uh, uh, bringing uh, uh, terrorism in Pakistan. Here, I want to mention a very important fact. Earlier, of course, uh, Bagheedi Junjua was talking about uh, ISIS KP. You know, ISKP, of course, it's an uh, offshoot of uh, uh, ISIS. Uh, if we talk about ISIS ideology, ISIS ideology is, of course, that they categorize themselves uh, different countries in uh, three. Number one, Darul Khalafa. Number two, Darul Hijra. Number three, Darul Kufr. By the way, obviously, Darul Khilafa is Iraq and uh, Syria. And if we talk about uh, Darul Hijra, Darul Hijra is Afghanistan for them, where they have migrated to and they are, uh, you know, uh, there in uh, three of the provinces. And that's where they are, uh, you know, originating from all of the activities. They are uh, originating from there. And if we talk about Darul Kufr, by the way, Pakistan to them, they class Pakistan as a Darul Kufr, a country that is part of Darul Kufr. So that is why they are active in Pakistan. I just want to highlight one more thing. Somewhere down the line, Farooq highlighted uh, earlier that, uh, of course, you know, financing and who's facilitating them, this is key. And that is the question which needs to be asked. We know that there, wi there was a terrorist attack conducted in Sri Lanka, Colombo uh, church attack. We know that uh, ISIS, when it conducted it, when it was probed, the uh, few of the elements, they were obviously connected to, the dots were connected to uh, India. Mm. So India's involvement was there. Somewhere down the line, of course, as we know that the defensive offense is still going on by India in Pakistan. So these elements are being used. And I think it's not only important for Pakistan to know it and say it, it is important for uh, uh, obviously Afghan interim uh, government as well. They must know and they should not be forgetting that while they were fighting against the Americans in Afghanistan, at the same time they were fighting against the ISIS as well. ISIS KP was obviously in a fight with the Taliban at the same time at that time. So I want to highlight this for Taliban regime sitting in Kabul that it is not only important for Pakistan to counter ISIS Khorasan, but it is important for them and for uh, their security as well. So joint you know, actions must be taken by Pakistan with the help of, of course, uh, uh, Taliban regime. And Tal Taliban regime must own the Doha Accord as well, because in Doha Accord, they committed to it that they will never allow their land to be used against any of the neighboring countries, including Pakistan. Mm. So it is important for them to sit with Pakistan and, of course, uh, bring a solution to this problem. And this problem must be solved but as soon they, as possible. Are they going to do that? They must do it. They must do it. And I think uh, this Dimash, which was, uh, which is obviously, uh, you know, handed over by uh, MOFA uh, to AIG, mm. I think uh, it should be taken seriously. And if they do take some steps with the help of Pakistan, whatever the help they require in terms of countering, uh, you know, ISIS Khorasan in them three provinces, Pakistan, I'm sure, will be able to help them and will be serious to help them okay. because this threat is not only for Pakistan, but it is for Afghanistan as well. 
Right, absolutely. But um, Junjua Sab, I want to understand then whether or not this is the perspective that is shared by the Afghan Taliban regime as well, that this is in the best interest of their own country. Um, I don't know if that, that alignment uh, will be possible uh, by sending out demarches or the kind of delegation uh, that you were also talking about. Haven't we already tried that um, and, and haven't really achieved perhaps what we were looking for? Is there something more that, that can be done diplomatically or politically uh, to achieve uh, that sort of alignment that is needed? And if not, what you talked about earlier in terms of military action across the border, I want to also understand that while that may be um, a resort on the table that, that, is, that is there as, as a last resort, but why um, is it that when, whenever we, we talk about uh, the way that we expect certain actions from the Afghan Taliban regime, um, we still are uh, talking about uh, something that we have seen hasn't happened. Does that, does that not make our demands or what we expect or uh, what our actions uh, are redundant in front of the, 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 the actions that we see in terms of terrorist activities? Where will we draw the line where we stop uh, the diplomatic or political effort and move towards the kind of military action that you were referring to? We have already uh, moved towards the military action. Oh, Across uh, the border. Yeah. Across yeah. the border. Our border. We are basically in a war to be understood, and we need to get serious. We cannot let uh, our uh, you know uh, army uh, soldiers and officers uh, uh, incur such heavy casualties. Uh, I mean, uh, they will stand up. They they are meant for that thing. They are uh, they are resolved as rock solid. And they'll take the battle to the enemy in many ways they are every day while you and me sleep there are seven to eight incursion attempts from across the border which are being foiled by these javans now these have to be given the strength uh, by our political uh, dispensation and the government has to get serious it has to seriously resource the and make up the capacity deficit the police uh, which is in kp needs to be uh, you know, uh, built up uh, on an emergency basis. Its capacity has to be uh, increased manifold. And unless this is done, and the civil administration part I already uh, alluded to, there is absolute vacuum of local intelligence. Where was that network of local intelligence of civil administration, which always tells you uh, the telltale sign that who is coming, who is going, who is living with these uh, tribe, uh, a vehicle comes laden with explosives and it takes a lot of logistics. So why was this information not passed to uh, the intelligence agencies which are already so overstretched and uh, they are fighting uh, on the entire uh, uh, frontier. Uh, so administrative vacuum, police capacity deficit vacuum and uh, unless we become serious and treat it as a whole of the nation uh, problem, uh, you know, this uh, heat will cross the Indus and start uh, impacting the settled areas. Like we are sitting and we're just commenting. Tomorrow we might be effective because if we don't uh, put this uh, stop to this thing at, uh, uh, you know, in these uh, newly merged districts and these settled areas which are abutting the Afghan border, things could become very difficult for us in our settled areas as well. So this nation needs to uh, gird up its loins and the whole of the nation um, uh, effort is required. We need uh, uh, capacity building of our civil administration and uh, our entire criminal justice system has to be uh, made, made responsible on an emergency basis to deal with this threat and the military courts which are much reviled and everybody uh, you know uh, criticized those I think we need to have a relook. Our judiciary needs to have a relook. If the criminal justice system is not responsive to right. terror, maybe this would be allowed. And the uh, diplomatic part, yes, we need to we need to upscale our assets. A high-level delegation led by no less than foreign ministers uh, and uh, other similar uh, important, uh, you know, uh, members of the government. They need to go to a fun interim government. And we need to leverage uh, their uh, Doha and Qatar uh, handlers. We need to speak to the United States. We need to speak to China. We need to give them credible evidence that, look, 
this is what is uh, being done right under the noses of IAG. And if it doesn't stop, we, we have the rights to you know, take the battle to uh, across the border. And uh, like uh, Americans were doing, they were using drones pretty effectively. And we have that recall so far. There is some kind of restraint. So, uh, and uh, how long will it be? Uh, I think we need uh, a very serious rethink at this point of time. Right, need absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Jinjua Sab, for joining us and being a part of the discussion. That was Brigadier Retired Rashid Wali Jinjua, Director of Research IPRI. Um, and he was talking to us with regards to what uh, we're going to be moving forward with in terms of the counter-terrorist activities um, and, of course, the collaboration and uh, the commitment that is required from the Afghan Taliban regime and the measures that Pakistan can, can take in this regard and the kind of re-evaluation uh, that needs to be there. We're now going to be taking a look at what is going on at the economic front of the country with uh, the state bank uh, emerging with a decision uh, of uh, retaining uh, the policy rate at 22 percent and a lot of um, experts have uh, already had already pointed towards this development uh, but what it, is it exactly uh, in terms of the way that the, it is going to impact the situation and what it means on ground uh, we're going to talk now in further detail and Farooq I want to take your perspective that while we talk about um, uh, this policy rate you've always mentioned about how high it is and how uh, much it's impacting our economic situation and and this was something that that a lot of experts have pointed towards also as as an expectation that is going to retain while we keep on talking about improvements um in in many indicators and the fact that pakistan is now moving towards a better trajectory uh, we have the staff level agreement of the um uh, first review of the imf as well um there are also of course uh, trends that we have seen previously at the pakistan stock exchange um even then we saw that the decision was taken that the policy rate is unchanged um what do you think of this and what exactly does this mean for us in terms of our economic situation now and in the recent future and whether or not this was the right move at this point in time right uh, Stana, thank you very much once again this is an important question i think that uh, um, i keep on actually interacting during this visit where i am right now with various business stakeholders of the country and I'm especially the uh, you know representatives of the uh, chambers of commerce uh, uh, in various uh, parts of the country, and I, I'm repeatedly told that this kind of interest rate is killing business because uh, if you uh, 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 if you are a businessman and if you are running short of cash, where do you go to get money? You go to banks. When the interest rate is so high. Uh, then it becomes cost prohibitive. And similarly, when you are an investor, you have money. And if you are getting this kind of returns on your money, which does nothing, uh, then you you uh, don't actually want to invest in various projects. So consequently, the economy does not grow. And uh, um, of course, uh, that's why everybody suffers. And because the economy is, good, uh, you know, deliberately uh, slowed down, you cannot think of getting out of the vicious cycle which creates uh, all these problems. There's a counter-argument also, especially by the experts, uh, and they say that whenever inflation is very high, in order to keep it low, or in order to actually bring it down uh, or avoid hyperinflation, uh, you have to actually match the levels of uh, inflation with interest rate. Now, uh, because at this moment, when you talk about core inflation, that is hovering around uh, slightly over 30 percent. So that's why this interest rate has been kept there as well. Uh, the only problem is, and uh, remember, these policies are made because, A, the uh, state bank is now autonomous and it is supposed to respond to these issues uh, this way. Uh, on the other side, also, uh, you know, IMF also keeps on pushing for uh, these kind of policies uh, because they uh, repeatedly say that it, uh, otherwise uh, the uh, alternative situation is that it might lead uh, uh, into hyperinflation. But the problem is that inflation still is, uh, 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 we have clear evidence that the interest rate is not controlling inflation. And uh, that is because uh, for past many years this has been happening. Uh, the government of Pakistan, uh, State Bank of Pakistan, kept the interest rate very, very high. 
and even then the only benefit uh, or positive side that we saw was uh, regarding government account deficit because people started um, uh, parking their hot money that they could have uh, they could uh, withdraw at uh, very very small notice or very little notice so with that kind of con consequences i think it is important of course state bank of pakistan is going to do whatever it takes and whatever it is asked by the government of pakistan which is in agreement with imf and these are neo neoliberal policies so it is important that the government of pakistan uh, talks to imf especially regarding uh, the interest rate with this kind of interest rate i don't think we will be able to control inflation we will not be able to uh, ensure that the economy also grows sir right and and sort of why is it then that we keep on hearing about how inflation is going to get better uh, in the first quarter of next year <coughs> uh, right uh, there are uh, the, there are uh, uh, two two kind of factors right uh, push and pull uh, one aspect uh, uh, is uh, regarding supply and then demand also uh what interest rate do is actually they curtail the the uh, you know demand but uh, we have had uh, inflation uh, because of uh, shortage or or, or uh, lack of supply of uh, various uh, you know uh, components of economy or for that matter um, uh, various products uh, so now uh, because our you know agriculture has actually produce better yields and then uh, circumstances all over the world are also getting better we have seen that oil prices have uh, stabilized also uh, so everybody hopes that in coming days we are going to see some kind of stability uh, regarding prices and then remember the dollar price uh, petrol price these things also matter uh, so um, if uh, these prices are uh, Uh, good uh, for the country and they are not very high then one can ensure, one can assure uh, oneself that in coming days other uh, you know measures that we have to take like uh, uh, particularly about a uh, fuel adjustment in electricity or for that matter in gas sector those elements can be phased out as well because then we will be uh, affording better price without actually incurring losses in petrol or consumption of uh, uh, you know fuel so in that kind of situation perhaps the inflation is bound to come down but right now as things stand sana a high interest rate may or may not work regarding uh, inflation but they uh, very surely are killing the economy All right, um, uh, Faisal. Uh, there is also, of course, the way that the the political situation is impacting our economic situation as well. Um, and while we talk about how we're engaging with the IMF, with the current team, there is always talk of continuity of policies as well, uh, and how exactly will will the the rest of the measures pan out, um, especially now that uh, we have elections coming in the country as well. How is it that we'll be able to sustain the path that we're currently on, and whether or not? uh the kind of improvements that we're seeing um are going to be uh uh what we witness um in the future and uh, during early next year as well um and if there is um a, a change um in the way that uh, the policy is moving forward what then will be our strategy yes yeah, and if we obviously uh, look at the current situation of the economy uh, one thing is for sure that the steps which has been taken uh, uh, by the interim setup of course uh, they are uh, taking Uh, these steps just to stabilize the thing we know that uh, the previous government the 15 months of the government in uh, that government of course our economy was on a roller coaster mm. and uh, during that time of course we have been seeing the inflation was out of control and uh, uh, of course uh, the matters matters were out of the controls uh, then comes the obviously interim government and uh, the way uh, they have been uh, you know uh, taking the things forward one thing is for sure they are just trying to stabilize the things and that is why the policy rate hasn't been changed but of course i would uh, agree with paro when he when he says that of 
it gets really hard for a for a businessman to decide whether to take money for further business or not uh, from the banks or uh, not because uh, this kind of uh, you know high rates of course uh, it puts them off and uh, in a in a but healthy we're also trying to attract more more of the business community both exactly local that's that's what I'm that's yes. that's where i was coming towards mm. that the only solution which i see and the only hope which i see is from obviously sifc and is from uh, the fdi foreign direct investments in our country in the businesses in the different sectors of pakistan which were introduced and highlighted by sifc very recently right. and i believe the money will be coming from outside and uh, why everyone is saying that the next uh, uh, early quarter of the next year uh, because it's uh, uh, of course it's an election year and uh, political stability would have a very positive impact on uh, economic uh, stability of Pakistan and in that context of course we'll see that the political shift it will bring a positive effect and uh, the new government of course would maintain itself and the uh, maintain the economic situation right of Pakistan. absolutely and that and that of course um, is the hope and we we, yeah. we really hope that, that positive that's impact what we would see. be seen absolutely thank mm. you Faisal and thank you Farak for joining us in the debate and we hope that whatever um, input uh, that we have so far received from the IMF and of course uh, the kind of financial schemes that we have in place is sustained and right decisions are taken in the future as well to put Pakistan on the path of progress and prosperity including of course our counter-terrorist activities and more diplomatic um, and um, uh, military channels that are of course uh, in alignment with reference to what is going on in the country and we hope that that is what we see and we are able to do that in the international community as well that's all that we have from the debate we'll now see you tomorrow